Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Davis Finney Foundation May YOPD Council. We're really happy to be here with you today. We're going to do some quick introductions of our panel members in case you are new to us. So right now, I just want each person, I'm going to call on you. I just want you to say, tell us your name, uh, tell us how long you've been living with Parkinson's, and maybe one fun fact about you. Karen. You're muted, sorry. I should have picked somebody that was not muted. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm Karen. Uh, let's see, I am 51. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's at 47. And one fun fact is I absolutely love gardening and cooking with my vegetables that I grow. Love it, thanks. Kat. Hi everybody, I'm Kat Hill. I am 55, I was diagnosed at 48. And I'm coming to you live from an Airstream trailer. <laughs> a new, a brand new trailer. Yay. A brand new uh, Airstream trailer. Robin. Hey, I'm Robin Morades. I am 52. I was diagnosed correctly at 46. And a fun fact of me is I was a clown performing at children's birthday parties when I was in high school. That is fun fact. Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm calling in today from a different location. Uh, I'm here at my parents' house uh, in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, I've been living with Parkinson since the age of 48. Thank you, Kevin. Heather. My name is Heather. I live in Northern California. I'm a Virgo. I like long walks on the beach. I mean, no, my, my wrong, fun wait, fact, wrong panel, wrong panel. My, my, fun fact, <laughs> my fun fact is that I do sight gags. Sometimes not on purpose. Oh yeah, I was diagnosed about uh, 12 years ago. Uh, Sri. My name is Sri and I don't know how long I've been living with Parkinson's, but I've had symptoms for eight years. And fun fact about me is this scarf, it's not a fact, it's just a note. This scarf was given to me almost 15 years ago and it's the first time I'm wearing it. My friend bought it for me, my friend Deborah in Italy. And so I'm debuting it here for all of you. Wow, that is yeah. that's special. It's a good day for it. It's a good day a good for day. it. Uh, all right, Beautiful. Naynad, here's what I would love. Naynad, if you could tell us who you are, how long you've been living with Parkinson's, a fun fact about you, and then get right into the music. My name is Naynad Bach. I have been diagnosed in 2010, and I love asparagus. I love asparagus. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I had another life. I would never walk straight. All the things I love to do, other people love to hate. Put my shoes on my ears, put my hat on my feet. Park the car in the kitchen, take a bath in the street. I love ping pong. I love bars. I love the three stooges and those crazy drums. I like lovers who don't know the same And lying on my bed The stars and the rain Oh yeah Now, if I had another life I would run, run, run Run, run, run Have some fun But seriously If I had another life I would run for president the pigeons in the park, never paid the rent. Heather Kennedy, Secretary of State, declares money illegal. That'd be great. I love people, I love dogs, anchovy pizza, and those crazy drugs. I like lovers who don't know the same. My bed in the stars and the rain. Oh, yeah. Ooh, oh, yeah. Now, if I had another life, I would do it all again. Run a movie from the middle, maybe at the end. Try to miss the target, with the biggest score. Tell my dad I love him. I love 
fond à la face La behind the corners and those crazy tracks I like a lot who don't know the same I'm Talking to my father in the stars and the rain If I had another life, if I had another life, if I had another life, if I had another life. There you go. All right, that was awesome. That was fabulous. It was fun to watch you. I I couldn't take eyes eyes of you. I almost forgot the lyrics. Still, we can't Thank sit you. still. What do we have Parkinson's or something? <laughs> Uh, five years ago. Every moment just now, which was lovely. Seven, was. seven years ago, I could not play the, this song because I could not play syncopation, you see. Yeah. So, Nena, tell tell that story. This is we're talking about limits today, and we're gonna talk about a lot of different things. We're gonna we're gonna kind of take things by category, but I'd love for you to tell some of the people here uh, on this panel and our community that have not met you and don't know a little bit about your story i'm going to share a lot of those links for everybody but tell us tell us what happened with your guitar playing well uh, in 2015 i was diagnosed in 2010 in 2015 i stopped performing live because i i, I could not just uh, my fingers would be stuck in front with strings like, uh, like syncopation is very uh, demanding on a brain i love heather is smiling from from the first second, <laughs> uh, I'm distracted completely. I'm just <laughs> doing she got you got a Heather anyway. crash going on. Yeah, Heather yeah. crash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's and uh, in my fingers would be uh, in, um, stuck with the strings. I like I just could not play. So I started to uh, by by coincidence, a friend of mine invited me to uh, table, table tennis club in Westchester called Westchester Table Tennis Center. Owner is uh, Will Shorts, uh, crossword puzzle uh, editor for New York Times. Okay. And, uh, and I went once and the next day I felt much better. So, okay, it can be accidental, you know, I, I don't know. So next week we went again, this friend of mine and I, and, and uh, I, I, next day I, I felt better immediately. So I said, there must be something there. So I increased, increased to two to three weeks uh, a week and then after three to four months i could play guitar again and since then i'm performing live so uh, wow. if, it, if, it, if it helped me i thought it can help other people so i organized ping pong parkinson non-for-profits uh, in 2017 and uh, and as of today we have over 140 chapters around the world so that's amazing and i'm gonna i'm gonna share a link with y'all i don't want to share it right now because you're gonna be way too tempted to go watch the video. It's so fun. So I'll share it a little bit later. Um, but also I just found out today, fun fact, you may already know this, but that there's going to be a ping pong room at the World Parkinson's Congress next year. Ah. Cannot wait for that. Very cool. Um, and Nainan, why don't you, um, isn't there a big, there's like a big Parkinson's. Tell us about the, the one in Texas coming up in July. Yeah, this is something uh, first time in history. I'll I'll get, go on my small smaller chair. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is what is happening uh, to give you uh, like overview. The people we who have Parkinson, we have no no access to para games of any kind in any sport. We are completely excluded from Paralympics, from para games. Any any we we have no classification. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this cl 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 classification for five years already and unsuccessfully. So finally, uh, uh, USATT, which is the United States Association of Table Tennis, they allow us to participate in not just para games, but regular games. So regular championship of the United States, we, we will have a special, uh, uh, will, will be a category. And we will get the main stage also at the end of the tournament. So that's something that we, we I want to people who play the level of playing is not important. But of course, if you play better, it's, it's better for us. 
but uh, if you if you have desire to play ping pong please uh, come to texas in july july 15th 16th 7th and uh, and participate in the and you may become a champion you never know you never know yeah, yeah. and cat hey maybe in your airstream you'll be finding your way around there so anybody who's out and about traveling and wants to go out there uh definitely uh check out the ping pong parkinson's again i will send all of those links um so nainat is going to be our our um bonus panel member today very happy about that and i'm going to turn it over to robin we're going to go through a bunch of different categories and uh talk talk about it ask questions share your experiences that kind of thing so robin take it away thanks mel so we were talking about this before the before we sort of joined live and we realized this all comes under the category of self-awareness and growth that we're all learning about ourselves as we have you know symptoms and as things progress or stay static for a little while and so we don't want this to necessarily be a downer because some of the limits that we all identified also come with some built-in solutions and adjustments along the way and Parkinson's is one of those um, diseases that the concept of agency is very important. You become an expert in your own disease management and what your own limits are and what might be okay for me might not be okay for Karen and vice versa. You really can't go by anybody else's experience. You really have to learn for yourself what you're willing to spend your energy on and how you're willing to spend your energy. So I want to start with a category that's um, just a very kind of obvious one. And we're going to talk about kind of physical, physical endurance. It can involve sports or something like that. And um, I'll kick it off just with an example from my own life. And then we'll, we'll just sort of call on some panelists. Last year, we did a bike trip where we rode our bikes from Pencil, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to D.C., down the Gap Trail and the CNO Canal Towpath Trail. And it's about a 300 mile bike ride and I booked um, an electric assist bike. And the outfitter got it wrong and brought me a regular bike uh, and on the first day. So um, I was gonna be able to switch out my bike on the second day, but for the first day I had a regular bike and we were maintaining a pretty fast pace on a trail kind of going about 14 to 15 miles per hour on a trail, which is pretty fast. That's kind of 17, 18 on a road bike, I guess. And we got about three quarters of the first day was about 60 miles. And we got about three quarters of the way through and I was cooked. I was cooked. And I, um, I told my partner, we had a, a last rest stop before the final 15 miles. And he said, well, we can go as slow as you need to go. And I started on, I got about a mile away from the rest stop. And I said to him, this isn't about pace. Like I'm done, I'm really done. And I don't, and I had enough experience from bike races in the past and big bike events where I pushed myself too hard and then I was destroyed. And this is the first day of a week long trip. And I said, I, I need to conserve and so I went back to the rest stop. I got a sag wagon back for the last 15 miles. And it was a good thing I did because those last 15 miles were straight up until the final couple miles down. But I didn't overdo it. And I got my electric assist bike and I was able to ride the next day. But I will say, I learned that very much the hard way because um, I had a lot of peer pressure in my marriage to keep up and keep going. So who else is, um, Kevin, I'm going to call on you because I know you mentioned something about sport. Am, am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I had an episode, I mean, constantly we're, we're, we're drawing boundaries where we say if we go beyond, we could get hurt. Uh, but, you know, I, I came off a situation about a month ago where I fell and I fractured a rib. And it was, I was skiing, you know, at the time, you know, and everyone told me, Kevin, you have no business to be on the slope. And, and I started thinking to myself, you know, I, I don't, I disagree uh, because for me, the mantra that I use is I don't fear falling, but I fear the day when people do not let me fall. And that sort of, I still live by that. Now, 
I broke the rule. The rule was never hurt yourself in any endeavor. And I set myself back for about five weeks of doing nothing. And that was really bad. But I wouldn't trade that fall for anything because the joy that I had getting there is the joy that I'm going to have going forward. I'm just going to be a little more careful. Excellent. Excellent point. Who else has a story with physical limits and endurance? Kat. I'll jump in. Um, my work required long, long hours and um, lots of 24-hour call shifts and um, was also a fairly physical job. So for me, very early in the process, I was not doing well managing my symptoms with that job. And, and therefore, it, for, it was really physical and lack of sleep um, reasons why I left. It, it was a job that I could no longer do safely and effectively. So the, the physical limitations um, for me rallied early. And, um, and I was very, I wasn't even formally diagnosed. I just had, had heard you probably have young onset come back in six months and, um, and we'll see. So um, I think if, if I had a less physical job or, or a job that didn't require so many long hours and up and down all times of the night, I, I, I would have enjoyed working longer, but I also, it was paramount for me to be able to keep my patients safe. And, um, and I learned that I felt better if I managed and accepted those limits earlier. I was able to manage my symptoms better, not working so many long hours. So it can be a trade-off. Well, and you transition into an important topic. We're talking about professional changes. And I don't want to pivot away from you, Kat, quite yet. While you kind of quit your day job, you didn't stop working. And you've done a lot of things <laughs> since that time. And so if you could just share with everybody. Um, I think for me, being of service and staying connected to community and um, keeping my mind working has been really vital to my um, well-being overall. So while I miss my career very much, um, I've, I've been able to pivot, I'm going to quote Kevin, uh, some, and I've, I've learned to do things I never thought I'd do. I learned how to do a podcast, and I've written a book, and I've gotten involved in all these webinars and learned how to use Zoom. I'm learning how to use new noise-canceling headphones. In, I'm in my maiden journey, so please forgive me. I'm not much of a techie, but I'm trying to learn to be, right? So, and I've met wonderful people. And, and I think, you know, we kind of have a choice in the loss part and the loss is hard and we grieve it. And it's, it's hard to pivot. Sometimes we don't want to pivot. I wanted to deliver babies for a long time. I wanted to get my kids through college before I left work. It wasn't part of my plan to get Parkinson's. Um, but it has brought me some richness and, and learning that maybe I have the ability to do many things and who knows what I'll pivot to next, you know, as, as li limitations in one area, it's sort of like other doors will open, right? Other you know, opportunities. Yeah. So living smaller now, mind you, we're only a week into this Airstream journey, but I'm loving how small and easy everything is in this small unit compared to our, our 3,400 square foot house. Um, it may get old, but for right now, it's an adventure. And I'm not sure we would have done it. We certainly would, have, would not have done it in our 50s. Um, so had I not gotten Parkinson's. So, you know. Thank you. Karen, I know it. you made a yeah. professional shift. Yeah, um, I could relate very similarly to what you were talking about, Kat, because our professions had similar physical requirements and mental and time re requirements. But um, at the risk of transitioning topics a little bit, but I, I felt compelled while you were talking to, you know, I, I experienced all those things professionally that you did, um, Kat. Most recently, my, my most profound and deeply um, uh, 
I learned a lot from the experience was learning about my own limitations um, with my own mental health and well-being in terms of caretaking for other people. I just recently had a really difficult experience where I just, I think being a nurse, and maybe you can relate to this cat or being in the helping professions, um, I've just structured my whole life around taking care of other people. And it's very hard to um, sometimes turn that camera lens around on yourself and sometimes to have the same clarity of vision on your own life that you might have upon someone else's. And somebody said to me, a really good friend said to me today, Karen, if someone else were describing what was going on in your life right now uh, with your limitations to your own mental and physical health, um, what advice would you give them? And I could very clearly give that advice to someone else. And then to give that self-advice back to myself and really had to admit, because I really hurt, you know, someone I deeply cared about, um, not knowing my own limitations. And, you know, I listened to what you said, Kevin, about how to avoid this going into a negative place. For me, I'm, I'm going to be really vulnerable here and share with you guys that, you know, I've been in recovery. I've been sober for 13 years you know, and I relapsed on medical marijuana. That's been really hard. You know, I had my, I convinced myself that I was going to be okay. You know what? I wasn't. I had my first episode of psychosis and my first episode of uncontrolled, you know, mania. I had, you know, was far from home when it happened, far from the people that love and care about me. I got stuck out of town somewhere. And I really didn't know how to get home and I really needed help and it was really hard. And I had to know my own limitations and I never thought, you know, I almost didn't come today. And I thought, no, no, there's value in sharing this because it's so yeah. fresh. They're so fresh to me, you know. Well, and Karen, you pointed out to me, all of our experiences can help someone wherever we are on the progression scale, whatever kinds of life experiences we're having. I assure you there's people in the listening audience who are having trouble with boundaries and focusing on themselves and taking care of themselves. And so you're not alone. And I'm really glad that you had the courage well, to share that. I can tell you as an advocate, when your very best friends, everybody you love on this planet, who you've surrounded yourself by has Parkinson's. I mean, I love you guys like you're my sisters and brothers. And it hurts to watch your friends suffering. And sometimes when you can't hold that pain deeply, you know, I think sometimes we turn on ourselves. So, I mean, I don't want to go negative here, but this is just something that's right before me and it just happened. And so I want to be, you know, with my community. I want to be real. I want to be a real person that you guys can relate to up here and not, you know, just this is real. This is Parkinson's in my world. So yeah. I love you guys for being here in the audience and my community. I feel as much a part of this community as, um, you know, I just feel blessed. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Ninad. You're on mute. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I, I, I admire your, your panel because I'm following you. You're like like a star to me. When I see Kevin talking, I, I'm, or anybody is what just Kevin said that it's it's very profound. And uh, I usually say that we didn't conquer the, with ping pong Park, so we didn't conquer Parkinson, but we conquered the fear of Parkinson. So it's it's important not to have fear. And uh, when they say disabled people, like what is distant. Distinct ability. This disability means distinct, distinct ability. So we have some special ability because we can maybe slowness uh, is an, an, an advantage actually because you can you can like I, I enjoy the slowness. So I'm trying to I, maybe I will do TEDx. Uh, what is Parkinson? What is there not to like it or to love it? You know, because in in a sense. Now I go to tram uh, bus in Europe, and uh, there are kids uh, raising up, giving me seats like it never happened before, you know. So that, that somebody would stand up for me to sit, and I, of course I don't sit, but uh, but it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a family 
uh, we had a world championship in New York in 2019 and people like I call this class of 2019 and, and we are like brothers and sisters and, and uh, we, we, we support each other and, 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 and love each other and we talk on, on, almost on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, we, we, are a, we are a big family and, and if we stick together, we will find even solution for, for this uh, diagnosis. I, I don't call this disease, I call this diagnosis because we don't know what it is. Thank you. And Heather, you brought up something really important in the chat of differentiating between the person and the symptoms. And I had read somewhere uh, in a neuropalliative journal article that we take on uh, people with neurodegenerative conditions tend to take it on as an identity. We're like a cancer, a person with cancer doesn't. You know, there's all these different diseases. I have diabetes, I have, you know, um, I don't know, breast cancer or whatever, but we tend to take uh, not just Parkinson's, but neurodegenerative. And it's very hard for us to emotionally separate some of the symptoms from who we are, because it's in our brain. <laughs> so um, I think that's a really important point. Do you have anything you want to add to this particular, any of the categories that we've covered so far? Yeah, Heather. I would love to add something to that comment. We talk a lot about the effects of a, of a medication called an agonist. And of course, I'm, don't worry, I won't go too deep with this, of course, but it does cause some behaviors that are very separate from the person. Mm -hmm. So I would just ask that within our community and outside of our community, we continue to educate ourselves and others and gather information about this so we don't shame people, so that we don't make it into a moral issue. It is most certainly not a moral issue. This is chemical and it is the strongest impulse that we're talking about here. It is dopamine, it is pleasure reward, which is tied in with our movement. So those meds that we need to move also change the pleasure reward centers. Mm -hmm. And we do deal with, you know, some pretty heavy mental things as we've been listening here. And everyone will have, will have a stab at this. It's not like Karen is unique. I think that everybody's gonna go through something like the, you know, the, the cause and effect of a medication at the very least. So nobody, you know, it's an even playing field here, folks. That's all I wanted to add. Thank so you. Three, we haven't heard from you yet. Do you have anything you want to contribute to any of the categories that we've done so far? Um, I will, I'm not actually sure what categories we've done. I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> um, I'll just touch upon a few different things. So in terms of limitations, driving at night, I do not like to drive at night so much anymore. And I have actually specific glasses that I have that help me to drive at night. It's a little bit anxiety inducing for me. And that's tough for me because I do like to go out to dinner with friends or all that sort of stuff but you know what i've adapted and if it turns out that um i'm no longer able to go out with friends at night well you know what if they care about me enough they'll pick me up or maybe i'll take the bus or there's uber or i just won't go and i'll save a lot of money so there's that um in terms of uh physical limitations i've encountered a lot uh in the sense that i for work for my current job it's in tech i have to type a lot so I used to type 120 words per minute faster than that. Now I'm like at 40. So it is- a, You're a mere mortal. <laughs> I'm a mere mortal, exactly. I And honestly, one of the things that I was always known for is turning around work so quickly. Boom, 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 I'd get it done. You know, intellectually, physically, everything. And now it takes me a little bit longer. But now instead of getting all my work done in four hours a day like I used to, maybe it takes me six. So maybe it takes me eight, maybe it takes me nine. So that has been hard for me because I really relied on my skill with my fingers and typing in response to get me through the day. And it's not like that anymore. Um, in terms of work limitations, I still work full time and I'm actually leaving my full time job in tech to do something that's a little bit uh, nuts, actually, that is um, more challenging physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, I'm going to be a photojournalist for a year. So awesome. I want a fellowship. I applied for a fellowship and uh, I won a fellowship to be a local uh, photojournalist, visual storyteller for a local paper. Wow. And that's, that's what I'm awesome. going to be doing. So, with my balance issues, swallowing issues, eye issues, speech issues, tremor, dystonia, I'm going for it. And uh, yeah, there we are. 
And Sri, let me ask you this. This is one a theme that comes up again and again. Did you feel more motivated to apply for this fellowship because of your condition? Is this something you would have maybe never done or put off, but for your Parkinson's? I don't know how to respond to that in terms of the opportunity, but I can say there's stuff that I'm doing now that I have not done before. I was talking to Kat about this recently offline. And uh, I think I'm doing more now after diagnosis than I ever did before diagnosis. So I'm pushing myself to do more and more. You know, I'm a Davis Finney ambassador. I started a project or a collective called the Women's Parkinson's Project. Kat is a co-founder. I've uh, taken on more work, more advocacy. I'm on webinars now. I would never have appeared on camera before Parkinson's. And now, or even at work on camera, now I'm doing this with dystonia, with tremor, with a lot of dyskinesia, you know, um, with speech issues, all of that stuff. Sometimes it's very apparent. And just quickly, I don't want to take up a lot of time. When I was at a work conference last week for my current job, um, one of my colleagues commented to my boss, and she only told me this a couple of days later. She said, is there something we should know about Shri? And my boss looked at her and said, she's very open about it. You should ask her. She actually didn't ask me, but my dyskinesia was off the charts that entire week. I basically seven days of straight dyskinesia. I could not get it under control. And I thought, oh, nobody has noticed. I'm hiding it. This is amazing. You know, because how do you go up to somebody and say, you look like you're a little weird. Like nobody would, very few people would say that to you. And when I found out that it was noticed, at least by one person, it really took me aback and by surprise. And uh, I was like, I don't know how to process this because with what Heather was saying earlier and somebody else mentioned it, how do I separate myself from the disease? And in that moment, I really couldn't. So I had a really rough night with that. And, uh, and I came out of it and I did a photo project specifically around that thing where I photographed myself having dyskinesia and posted it online. And, you know, my friends are like, wow, you posted that image. And I'm like, I did because I need people to see this is a real thing. This is me having Parkinson's. So when I twitch and move, I mean, it is Parkinson's, but it's not, it is a medication, but it's not, it's not so easy to separate the two. So, yeah. Well, and I want to pick up on something you said, Tree, about posting something on Facebook. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I got off of Facebook because of my divorce and found that my quality of life improved in every area by just not being on social media, not even because of the politics or anything, just the attention divide that it required. And so I opt to not be on social media because I feel so incredibly frazzled and drained when I'm on social media. So that's a limit I've set for myself. And related to that, um, with the political spectrum and everything, and I don't want to get into politics other than everyone is pissed off in a slingshot position all the time. And it's not something that I can afford to do. And it's a deliberate choice that I make not to get pissed off about everything that's happening all over the world all the time. I'll so, just comment um, on that really quickly and then I'll leave it for yeah. everybody else. So I actually didn't post it on Facebook. I posted it publicly on Instagram and I did 30 days of Parkinson's during Parkinson's Awareness Month. I didn't tag anybody and I didn't tag any friends or use hashtags. So it's really meant for people who don't know what Parkinson's is to see what I go through every single day. So every single day there is an image along with the poem or a spoken word, a prose thing. And that was to educate people like the people in my other circle. And I actually thrive on social media. So quite the opposite of you, but you know, so I know my limits as well. So when it comes to politics and social and stuff, I am vibrant and thriving on Twitter. And then when I need to take a break, like I did yesterday, I'm like, I just log off the account, tell my friends I'm taking a five day break. Let me know if Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck break up. That's big news to me, you know, big news and anything else. And I go about my life and then I log back on when I can. Kat, thank you, Kat. Yeah, thanks, Sri. That's awesome. That's awesome. I um, I just wanted to share a tidbit that I, I learned early in my journey with Parkinson's, and that is I didn't want to define my whole day by my symptoms. And so instead of saying I'm having a bad day or a good day, I use the word symptomatic. And my family, and that's mm. partly a clinical term, Karen, I know you can relate to that, but 
instead of, I, I can be having a great day with lots of symptoms, or I could be having a great day without any symptoms. So I've tried to use the definition of I'm feeling very symptomatic today, or you might notice that I'm very symptomatic and my hand is shaking today. Even with kiddos, I, I watched my, my niece who is three. Um, she's really like my third cousin twice removed or something, but niece for, for, for all purposes. Um, and I explained it to her because I think it's important for her to understand why my hand is shaking and that that's a, a, a symptom, but it doesn't mean I'm doing badly or or, or if I'm hurting, I say, you know, I'm having some pain. I think that's symptomatic today or whatever. So just choosing our words even helps us frame it in our brains differently. Um, so just a little food for thought. If, if you try changing your language a little bit and even street telling your, your coworkers, maybe yeah, you're right, I really am symptomatic today. That can happen sometimes with Parkinson's. Um, oh. Maybe they'll be more open to asking you about it. Excellent yeah, I just wanted point. to I just wanted to say something real quick because Colleen put a really interesting comment there. And I think maybe you all have some some thoughts on it. I'm sure that you've probably experienced it in some way or another at some point. But she says, when I refer to being symptomatic, my mom thinks I'm using PD as an excuse. Uh, what are has anybody had that experience? Um, yes, yes, yes. OK, awesome. What are some things that you've used to communicate with other people when when they're, you know, think that you would be used like what who would use this okay heather we are pretending to be well that's why it's so confusing mm. my friend saw me walking in the park when i just told her i couldn't walk that day which was true three hours before that so what people need to know about parkinson's is that it's it's like a wave it's just going to come and go once you get far along you know you cannot make plans ahead of time that's just what I'm going to say. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I cannot make plans ahead of time. What, what would y'all say? Kevin. Yeah, to the same point, I've always said in my talks, when you have Parkinson's, you don't fake your disease, you fake your wellness. Mm, excellent point. Shri, you raised your hand for that one too, I think. Um, I think I did. I'm not sure, but I'll say it. I fake my illness <laughs> when I don't want to meet certain people. Guys, I'm really having a rough day today. So I use that to my advantage. My mom will say, you always have a backup plan for everything. You always have a meeting or you always have an excuse. I'm like, great. And I have Parkinson's. That's my constant thing. And I think it's very hard for people really quickly. I had my parents 50th anniversary recently. And uh, we, I helped coordinate it. I was up from 7 a.m. that day till 2 a.m. the next day doing all of this stuff. And I had uh, somebody come up to me and say, oh, well, you don't even look like you have Parkinson's. You actually didn't have any issues. And on that day, I didn't with all of that stress. And I think part of it was I was surrounded by family and friends who loved me, who all knew I had Parkinson's. And that I think that connection, that touch really stabilized me. But then a couple of days later, when I'm feeling drained and exhausted, they don't understand. And I think this is common for people who don't have Parkinson's or another type of disease like this MS or anything else like that, that they are not able to really understand how can you be up one minute and down the next minute. And even if you explain it to them, they still don't get it because they visually see that you're laughing, smiling, joking. And the next minute you're in bed, like exhausted. And I do not know how to convey that message to them. I still don't after all these years. Karen. Yeah, I can so relate to how you're describing it. So aptly Sri, I, I've realized that I don't have to seek uh, support from the same sources that I used to because they don't serve me anymore. Like some of my family, they just don't get it. They don't, you know, I don't know if it's just, um, I just find it so much easier to call a friend with Parkinson's or even just shoot a text real quick to one of my Parkinson's peeps and just a smiley face back does the best for my day, just to know they're there. I mean, when I send Heather a little smiley face in the morning in San Francisco, we may not even have an exchange, but I know she saw my smiley face and, you know, I know that we're interacting in our day somehow. And it's the smallest interaction, but it's the hugest interaction. It's the same, you know, it's the same thing with all of you guys. I really feel that way, so. Kat and then Nanad. Kat, you had your hand. Do you want to be acknowledged? Okay, Kat, then Nanad. Yeah, 
I just I just think too that that just as we are learning about the disease, those around us are learning about it also, and and you can provide information and resources for them, and as they are ready, they will either choose or not choose to learn more about it. But I, but I also think at some point we need to to be honest with ourselves that that isn't always our responsibility either. Our responsibility we're kind of back to being aware of ourselves, taking care of ourselves, and and what peop- other people choose to take away or not take away, we can't take that on. That really is not our responsibility, um, except maybe for Sri, um, who, <laughs> who cracks me up and makes excuses. I can only say that because I've known Sri for a very, very long time, at, and I'm, I'm giving her a bit of a hard time. So you, I know you well, Sri, and so does your mom, it sounds like, too. The <laughs> nod. So we, we, we shouldn't have expectations from others to understand because how do you how do you explain that your 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 hand is in your pocket and you cannot take it out? Like how, how do you explain that to to person who can button easily something? It, you, it, I don't expect anybody. My family also they, they think they know but but they don't. Right. You know it's it's just uh, we if we don't expect that it, it's much easier. Well, and this transitions into a perfect conversation about asking for help, knowing when you need to ask for help, how do you ask for help? Karen, do you want to go for it? Okay. Yay. Yes. Um, I, uh, I was afraid to lean hard into my relationship for the first time. Um, this has been, I mean, not that getting into Parkinson's diagnosis is not leaning hard into your relationship because it certainly is. That's a big whopper and losing your career at 47 and all kinds of other things, but to lean into it in a way where I was like really intimately vulnerable and emotional and say, I am hurting, I'm suffering, I'm using poor tools, you know, and, um, I need people around me and I need to ask for specific things from my community and from my friends and from my husband. And that's been wonderful to actually like have that soft place to land and to realize like I can trust my support systems when I need them because I don't always need them, but they're there. And now that I need them, it's okay to lean into them. And I, you know, I think um, that is really important for me personally. Excellent. Who else? Shree. So I hate asking for help unless I'm feeling really lazy. And I'm like, mom, the orange juice, please get me some. (laughs) And she'll just look at me and she's like, get off the couch, you know, but when I need help, I I don't, I mean, fake help I like, but real help, it frustrates me. I get very irritated and frustrated with myself when I can't open a grocery bag, when I can't open a pill bottle. I tried for two days to open a little face cream tube with those little things on it. And I refused to ask for help. I'm like, I'm doing it on my own. And I'm, it's partly it's stubborn, but partly it's, it's scary to have to ask for help, honestly. And then often when you ask for help, people give you help too much. I'm like, I don't need help carrying groceries in. I can open the door by myself. So I don't want to be that person that everyone, oh, look, she's here. Here's a chair for you, auntie here's this cane for you. I'm like, if I ask for help, then that's when I need it. But otherwise, please don't give it to me. Or if you see that I'm really extremely shaking, then tell me, but it's a balance. And so I still have a lot of emotional swings with that. I, you know, that's something I still struggle with. Yeah. Thank you. I have asked complete strangers for help on the street. (laughs) especially at Home Depot and Lowe's with huge bags of mulch. And I just play the weakling. It has nothing to do with my Parkinson's. I say, hey, can I borrow your muscles? Can you just put this in the back of my car for me? You guys are like, yeah, happy to do it. So I think also um, those of us from 12-step recovery are used to asking for help much more. It's not something that scares me anymore. Um, in fact, we almost have a saying, how can you tell the difference between an old ti- old timer and a newcomer? The old timer is much more quick to pick up the phone and ask for help when something's not going right and say to someone, how do you see this? So um, I've you know, been pretty okay with asking for help when I need it, but right now I'm not needing massive amounts of help. I'm not dependent on someone else for my activities of daily living or 
And we were talking about the other day, you know, some of these child-proof containers are just human-proof, so nobody can break into the <laughs> vitamin bottle. Um, Kevin, it looked like you had something you wanted to say. Am I imagining that? Okay, I'll go to someone else. Okay, Heather. You made me think about my friend that I spend time with. He has MSA and dementia. Mm. So two thoughts. One is he has the hardest time opening things. Can people who design packages please switch it up a bit? And the second thing that I thought is, please don't rob people of their joy in helping. So I love going to see him. And I had to beg his partner to let me go. She's like, I don't want to burden you. I'm like, burden? He thinks I'm the most fascinating person on the planet. We sing Elvis together every five minutes because he forgot we just sang it. Are you kidding me? Who else wants to hear me sing over and over again? Nobody. He does love it, spend time with people and do things for them. Being of service helps us feel purposeful as well. So for people who are, you know, the, the, the diagnosed and, and not just, you know, the, the, the carers or whatever you want to call people who hang out with us and really tolerate us and help us out. Um, we love to have a job. We need a job. We love to have a purpose. So thank you for allowing us to be of service to you. And uh, there's some great new podcasts for carers, by the way, I just want to mention. So check everything out. You know, there's, there's something for everybody. A couple of people have put some things in the chat that I'd like to ask the panel. Um, somewhere way back in the feed, I saw that someone said, I feel a limitation around going out to eat because my tremor is making it hard for me to eat. Um, has anyone had experience with that? And I, I know about, I haven't used, but I know about weighted utensils that uh, some of people that I know bring their own utensils. Shri, do you have some experience? Yeah, on an airplane. <laughs> My dyskinesia, my tremor gets a little shaky and I've knocked over tomato juice on myself and a couple of other people more than once. Mm. So I have to be a lot more careful with that. Um, my dyskinesia actually more than my tremor gets, gets me. And, you know, I am very wary about eating out in public and also with swallowing and slowness of chewing, but I just go very slow, make sure I have enough space. And sometimes I just don't eat out in public. It's too much for me. And I'm just like, no, I'd rather eat in. So I don't like to push myself in that way. Plus, even before Parkinson's, you know, eating spaghetti or a burger is very messy. It's all over your face everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, an alternative is spending time with your friends, the ones who are understanding, if you want to spend time with them, order Grubhub and have them come to your house. Yeah. So that you're, you know, you're spending the quality time with the people that you want, but you're not having to deal with being in a public setting. Kevin. You're unmuted. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yeah, you know, my biggest issue, actually, and I, I used to love to go to the hot restaurants that were a scene, right? <laughs> Loud music, and, you know, you're yelling at each person next to you. I can't do that anymore. I mean, I literally go into these loud restaurants, and I shut down. I, I get catatonic. And so, um, you know... I find that one of the things that has really helped, we, I went out the other night with some friends and we found a private room and that mm -hmm. made all the difference in the world or doing what, as you said, Robin, you know, ordering food and coming to the house because I don't want to lose these friends, right? Right. Someone else in the chat talked about um, ordering uh, cutting is hard for them. So ordering food that doesn't require cutting like a salad or a, you know, a burger or something like that. So that's another strategy. Um, I've also, this is weird that I have this tip, but I was with somebody one time and we actually told the waiter, please cut it behind the, please, oh. the steak. it was a steak. And we said, please cut it behind the, in the kitchen. Great. And yeah. they did it and nobody thinks twice about it. And you know, it's just, it's an easy thing. And they're happy. Perfect example of how to ask for help. That right. one would have never occurred to me. I would have struggled. <laughs> so funny. We can learn so much from all of these things. Um, let's see if, what else we've got here that hasn't been covered. Let's talk about traveling. Let's end on a, on a happy note, I guess, with traveling. And what are your tips for successful traveling? 
a lot of us, myself included, are traveling more than ever now because we want to take the opportunity to do it. So, Kat. I think for me, it's just taking time, slowing down. Don't be in a rush to get from point A to point B. Know that, that it's, I, I just cannot be in a rush and I can't have a deadline on the other side. Giving myself time and a window saying, you know, it's my intention to be there at 11 a.m., but it may be noon and I'll text you if we're running late because it just, makes me so much more symptomatic if I get worried that I'm holding people up or if I'm worried that I'm moving slowly. Um, I also think checklists be the new Airstream owner. Having a system to go over things helps reinforce that I'm not missing something. So I think um, uh, having patience with myself is the biggest thing and not having expectations that are unrealistic. Um, because I, I'm with you. I want to be out there on the road. Thank you. Nanad and then Kevin. I'm traveling on Monday for 45 or 50 days um, to Europe, uh, Germany, German Open, Denmark, Croatia, Portugal, and Texas. And Oklahoma. And Portugal, Denmark, and Texas. <laughs> yeah, so it's like... Uh, what, what I do, I ask for pre-boarding. Uh, that, that that helps me because I'm too slow. It's 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 a little bit embarrassing when people are waiting behind you. So I, I don't want to, people to wait. So they they are very accommodating. Uh, yeah. and, it, and, and, and in general speaking, we should all relax a little bit. Uh, whether spaghetti fly or not, who could the cares? You know, what, what's the big deal if the spaghetti flies? So. Flying spaghetti, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. So we should all be a little bit more relaxed about it. Uh, and people are actually, people are very genuine, actually, in, on, on, on an average person. They're very, very uh, helpful. And uh, I, pl I f flew over the world twice, made a trip around the world, and people are really generous, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Yeah, you know, I, I just flew yesterday, so this is very fresh. And 48 hours before, I just went in for a uh, adjustment on my DVS settings. Mm. And I was feeling really sort of um, dystonic and shaking more than I usually am, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really kind of afraid to rent a car. You know, it's one of those things like, well, when I land, what am I going to do, right? So to put myself at ease, I decided to go very light, just travel with a backpack and my iPad instead of my big laptop. And I took instead of, um, I said, no rental cars this time. I'm going to take BART and I'm going to do Uber the entire time. It takes a little bit longer, but as the nod said, I wasn't in a rush. And it just, I actually felt really good about taking Bart to my parents' house last night. So slow it down and look at alternatives. I think when you're feeling something that's coming up. Yep. My partner and I made a pinky pack that if we can't afford to fly at the best flying times, then we can't afford to take the trip. No more like late night. We we ended up taking a flight and then the flight was delayed and we didn't get into our destination till one o'clock in the morning. You know, that knocks me out for the whole long weekend that we're supposed to be having fun. So, in fact, as soon as this ends, we're leaving for the airport. It's my mom's 80th birthday. We're going down to Miami to celebrate with her. Karen, did you yeah. have your hand raised for an idea, too? Yeah, I I travel very differently when I travel by myself than when I travel with my husband. I didn't realize how much he actually does for me. I, I mean, he just uh -huh. does everything for me. Um, and so when I travel by myself, I actually take a wheelchair. When I travel by my with him, you know, I mean, he just, he takes my bag and he lifts everything and he makes sure I'm in line in the right place and back from the bathroom. And it's just, I can't do it without without some assistance without him. So I'm okay with that. I, I just know if I travel alone, I take the wheelchair because I have freezing of gate and security when we go through the, um, what do you call that? The TSA. 
yeah the tsa so line the x-ray narrower and narrower, narrower i just get frozen and then i'm stuck and i can't move so instead of dealing with that explaining it and tripping and maybe falling and i just take a wheelchair it's just easier yep i see lots of conversation in the chat about securing a seat on an airplane on the aisle near a bathroom yes taking pre-arranged restroom stops before you actually feel the need to use the restroom anybody else got any other tips that are not in the chat shri yeah the other thing i do is um, i'm looking into diapers so i will look into diapers that are a high absorbent for bladder control that hasn't happened to me yet but i have a feeling it might soon and I also don't drink a lot of water when I travel. I uh, try not to drink a lot of water on the plane. And I also try and take a sleep somehow because sleeping tends to stop the need and then do it that way. So it depends on a combination of those things. It depends on the depends. Yes, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I, I got that one too. I. I I, um, it's a tough one because I'm, while I'm tempted not to drink a lot of water, also if I get dehydrated though, yeah. I don't feel good and my meds don't work as well. So, um, and, and it, it, and I have to put on my nurse hat, sorry, Sri, but, but flying dehydrated is not, it, it, planes will dehydrate you. So, so be careful. It's so tempting though with bladder issues, but there are some great products out there, that those absorbent depends i prefer not to call them diapers but depends that work well and they're fashionable too they come in black and skin tone excellent um oh. we are yeah we are like just at the top of the hour but um heather i just want um heather to chime in a little bit she said she's got a, a few reflections um I and maybe to, some yeah i want to say thank you mel first of all Welcome back. We are so happy you're here. I'm thank thrilled you. you're here. Robin, thank you for doing this. Kat, thank you for always being so solid too. And Karen and Kevin and Shri, I learned so much from all of you. I just want to say thank you. And Nenad, the first time I saw you, you came walking up like a dream at the Portland WPC. You had the coolest hat. You had one of your classic suits on. You touched my phone or did something. And all of a sudden I had all your info and I thought, this guy's magic. You are a technical whiz, you're a musician, you sang, you, you had your guitar, you were fascinating. And thank you for being here and singing for us. What a diverse, fabulous, fun population we have. We are vibrant. We are not a monolith. Our disease does not define us. And Davis Finney's foundation helps us live better. So I just want to put that all in together. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to be here. Thank well, you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.